I want to lift up the name of Jesus for the grace he has made available. I'm speaking this morning on gratitude for a new beginning. This is a new beginning and I think the best way to start this is to give God all the praise and all the thanksgiving for this very rare privilege. I do not take this opportunity for granted at all. So I take it with all of my, all of my heart and with all seriousness. Um, and I would like to start by giving gratitude to God for this new beginning. Psalm 98 verse 1 to 9. Psalm 98 verse 1 to 9 it says, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy hand has gotten him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness has he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He has remembered his mercy and his truth towards the heart of Israel. All the ends of the heart have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Can somebody shout a loud hallelujah unto the Lord? It's a sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and with the voice of a psalm. With trumpet and sound of cornet. Make a joyful noise before the Lord the King. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands. Even people can clap their hands this morning. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Can somebody say amen to the words of God this morning? Why should we be grateful for a new beginning? Number one, because we are alive and we are well. And we are part of this new beginning. When you are part of a new beginning, it is time to give thanks unto the Lord. God's grace over our lives and for everyone that is here this morning is new. His grace is new. Only the living can praise the Lord, not the dead. Psalm 150 verse 6, Psalm 150 verse 6, it says, Let everything... That has breath, praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Everything, everyone that has breath, praise the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 to 23. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. It says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God is faithful. Isaiah 38 verse 18 to 19. Isaiah 38 verse 18 to 19. It says, For the grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, with emphasis, the living. It says this twice in that scripture, that verse. It says, The living, the living. Here this morning we are living. It is possible for someone to be living. But it's halfway dead. It's on the hospital bed, so it's managing to breathe. Even though if doctor says, goes to check him, they say, he's still alive, he's still breathing. But he's not living. Everyone that is here this morning, we are living and we are delivering. He say, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. So because we are alive and we are well, and we are part of this new season, we have every cause to give thanks unto the Lord. Why should we give thanks unto the Lord? Number two. A new beginning gives us the privilege to rewrite our past and any ugly untoward history. I repeat that again. A new beginning gives us the privilege to rewrite our past and, and, and any ugly or untoward history we may have. When someone is alive, he has the privilege to rewrite his history. When someone has the opportunity of waking up on a new day, he can decide on that day to stop whatever he's been doing before that has given him a bad name. If a man has been doing evil for such a long time and he decides on a particular day and he says, today is the day, and he follows through on what he has decided to do, it's a new beginning for him. So when a man is alive and is able to see a day like this, it's an opportunity to rewrite your past and any ugly. Because many of us have many things that we can't even talk about in public. Ugly things, ugly that, that people have kept under the nice suits or clothes. But when you are alive and you are well, you can rewrite that history. I remember the story of a man that is called the Nobel Laureate. The award that is called Nobel Laureate, as you know it today, that fellow, in the days that he was alive, was the fellow who designed the first atomic bomb that killed a lot of people. But the man said, when he dies, he will not like to be remembered as the man who killed a lot of people with his atomic bomb 
innovation or invention. He says, I would like to change it. And while he was alive, he inaugurated the same Nobel Laureate Peace Prize that we have up until today. In his own lifetime, he changed the course of his own history. And I'm praying for everyone that is here this morning. Who needs his story to be rewritten? That day is today for you in the name of Jesus Christ. The question is often asked, what will you do differently if you were to have an opportunity? That question is posed to people like me all the time. And people like you, some of the time, you will get such a question. What will you like to do differently if you were to have another opportunity? Maybe you are, you, you've lost a job or you have been fired from a place, for example. And then they do what is called an exit interview for you. So they ask you the question. So you have seen that you have done this wrong thing. That's why we are laying you off from this company. But if you have another opportunity, what will you do differently? That question can only be posed to a man who is alive. Since you are alive, you can fix that problem you have with God. You can fix that problem you have with your spouse. You can fix the problem you have with the world. You have the capacity to rewrite your history when you are alive. You will see an example in the scripture. Moses rewrote his own history. Moses was a pampered palace boy who used to live in the house of the king, Pharaoh. And he became a runaway because of the crime that he had committed. He had killed someone, as you know the story very well. And he ran away, what the military would call a way without official leave, a wall. He just disappeared from the palace and they were looking for him. And in fact, he va vanished into the thing here for a long time. But he had opportunity to rewrite his own history. God turned him into a mighty prophet and a deliverer of a nation, or of the nation of Israel. Same man in Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 to 12. When you study his story, you will know that he was a man who had many weaknesses. For example, in verse 10 to 12, the Bible says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech, and of a slow tongue. The man was trying to let God know, I have this weakness, I cannot, uh, I can't do the job you're asking me to do. Many of us, there are things God wants us to do, but because we think we have certain weaknesses, we don't want to embark on some of this journey. As a matter of fact, in verse 11, in verse 11 it says, And the Lord said unto him, who has made man's mouth? Who maketh the dumb? Who maketh the deaf? Or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? I make all of them. Those who are blind, those who are deaf, I make everyone. Verse 12. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and thou shalt teach what thou shalt say. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses because he was still trying to resist God. He didn't want to go forward. The Bible says the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, be, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. This is a man who has struggled so much about his own speech. He felt he couldn't do certain things. But when you jump to Acts chapter 7, verse 22, Acts 7, verse 22, same man who was struggling. Look at what the Bible says about him in Acts chapter 7, verse 22. The Bible says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Look at the conclusion. It says, and was mighty in word and in deed. The past and the conclusion of the matter. I pray for you this morning, everyone that is here, it doesn't matter what you have struggled with and you need to rewrite that part of your history. Receive that grace this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> David rewrote his own history from a shepherd boy in the village, in the bush, to the king of Israel. History rewritten. There are many people who are David's peers in those days that they were in the bush together. Some perished there. It is only those that made impact and changed the course of their history that will be remembered many years to come. You think David was the only shepherd boy? Millions of them were there. They were all shepherd boys in the bush. Some were even killed by the animals. Animals attacked some of them and they were wasted away. But that's not your own story. God kept you alive so that you can rewrite whatever it was that was happening to you before. When you look at the scripture in 2 Samuel chapter 5, Verse 1 to 4. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1 to 4. Showing how God changed the story of this young lad. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in times past, when Saul was king over us, thou was he that led us all out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. Verse 3. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord and they anointed King David king over Israel. David was 30 years old 
when it began to rain, and it rained for 40 years. History rewritten. Longevity added to his life, even from 30, it rained for, for 40 years. I pray for everyone that is here this morning. The story of your life is about to be rewritten in the name of Jesus Christ. And you can go on and on. Of several people in the Bible, the madman of the Gadara, blind Bartimaeus, God changed all of their history. What is the third reason why we must give thanks to the Lord for this great beginning? The great beginning gives us opportunity to surpass yesterday's record. A great new beginning gives us opportunity to surpass yesterday's record by conquering new grounds. When we are alive, it's an opportunity to surpass what has happened before. And that's why I love the RCCG a whole lot. Every record that they have set for themselves, they've broken. I mean, many of us were part of the first old auditorium in those days in camp. I used to be part of that old auditorium. I used to go there, even though I was not a pastor then. But when it was time to move to the second one, we felt, oh, that was just awesome. When the time for the three by three kilometer story came around, some of us were wondering, so what, what, what new thing is going to happen? What type of stress is this going to bring upon us? But the man of God knew what he had and what God was asking him to do. Today, three kilometers by three kilometers is full to the brim. During the convention, I'm sure you saw it. The other older one where we used to be, filled to the brim. Viewing centers all over Nigeria, people, and all over the world, not only in Nigeria. So when you are alive, it's an opportunity to surpass the records of the past. You yourself can beat your own record. It doesn't matter what you have achieved before. Some of the time we are stuck in our ways, we think that where we are today, is the best that can be. You are wrong, sir. Ma. If that's the way you are thinking, you are wrong. There is no one that is here this morning that is alive that God is not able to give something new that he has never done before. We saw the story of Joshua in the Bible. Even when he was, he was 80 years old, he was asking for a new mountain to be taken. I pray for you this morning that whatever records you have had in the past, God is about to give you new grounds to conquer in the name of Jesus Christ. Joshua 1, 3 to 4, every place that the soul of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given unto you. And I said, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and unto the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your coast. I prophesy new levels for everyone that is here this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Everywhere that the soul of your foot shall tread, the Lord is taking it for you today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. But for a reason why we must be grateful to God for a new beginning is to excel above our fathers. I'm to, I spoke about surpassing yesterday's record for new ground. But this one is to excel above what your fathers have done. One of the biggest errors or failures that can happen is for children not to support their parents. Every parent that is a parent, correct parent, when your children are going to school, one of the prayers you are going to be praying for them is to say, You'll be greater than me. Of course, some parents don't want that to happen. I'm sure you know. There are parents who have become very big in their own house. They have 20 cars. They have 20 houses. They are the only child accountant in their family. They've been sent to at some point in time. Some have even been governor. So, they think that for 34, 30, 40 years to come, it should just be their own name that will be mentioned. But the desire of God for everyone is that every son must surpass the greatness of their father. And it was proven in the Bible. Abraham... The Bible says he was a great man. When he got to the son um, Isaac, the Bible says he was very great. When he got to the son of who was the man? Israel. He said he was exceedingly great. That is God's design. He wants the father to do well. In every generation he wants everybody to do well, to the best that they can achieve. Because things will change. Technology will change. All manner of things will come. So as these things come, it gives you the potential to move from where your parents stop and shoot above them. So, when you are alive on a day like this, you have the opportunity to excel above our fathers and our progenitors. Genesis 32, verse 9 to 10. The Bible says, And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. But with my staff I passed over this Jordan and now I am become two bands. A man who ran away like a vagabond when he was coming back, he came back with two bands. I pray for you this morning. It doesn't matter what your parents have achieved at any time in history. The great to be above them. Receive it today in the name of Jesus Christ. Why should we give thanks 
on a day like this. To manifest the newness of the nature of God. God is new. His power does not faint. To manifest the newness, the newness, the newness of the greatness and the nature of God. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 to 31. Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. He said, have you not known? Has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the hands of the earth, fainted not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increased strength. Verse 30 says, even the youth shall fall and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. What made it possible? The newness of God every day. His messages are new. His power is new. His greatness is forever new. I pray for everyone that is here this morning. Receive newness over your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Why should we give thanks on the Lord? Number six, because of a necessity. The old must give way for the new. Of a necessity. Old must go. New must come. You and I don't even have power to stop that. So when new comes, embrace new. Because as God has ordained the things of the world, old must go, new must come. God has ordered it. That's part of the power of God for every man. Old must go, new must come. New business must come, old businesses must go. Many of you who are around, I was speaking at an, at an event yesterday, and I was trying to show them in 10 years what will happen. Many of the jobs that people are doing now, they will not exist again as time goes on. I'm sure you know. In the days that technology has taken over the whole place, when we were all young, we would go to the bank and stay there and collect teller, teller and hold and wait, and wait until your number is called, and then you come forward. The amount of money that the ATMs make for the banks now is more than the entire human beings that may be sitting there, most likely, except for those who structure mega loans and deals like that. But in terms of collection and payment, no man, collectively, group of men, can do much more than the ATMs can do. Old must go, you must come. The time is coming that you will not need to drive your car yourself. You just sit down somewhere at the back of the car and then you put something there and it takes you there. Somebody was supposed to see me in my office last week and he, he, shot, he took a shot of what was happening on top of Milan Bridge and he sent it to me. He said, it will take me one hour, so, so, so minutes to get to your office. I'm not sure I want to go. I said, don't bother. Traffic is too much. They just stay in your office. Was that possible 10 years ago? No. Old must go. You must come. That's the way God has designed it. Old must always go away. Human beings will keep coming with new things. As long as we are alive, old must naturally go. You must come. In the past, people will come to church and they bring their heavy, heavy Bible to church. And then, that's how to show how much of a believer you are. How loaded you are with Bible. Dicks, this Bible. With dictionary and concordance to come with it. And then we carry him book. Today, you don't have to do that. In fact, when these things, these gadgets first came to church some 10 years back, they will put it in the, at the door. No telephone. Your phone must not ring in church. Can you say that to your members now? Don't bring phone to church. Say, keep your phone at home. For what? The man tells you that my, my Bible is on my phone. They say, no, on this phone we have WhatsApp. He said, well, so how does that bother you? Whatever has been written in the Bible is also written on this small app that is on my phone. And that's the way I want to read my Bible. Can you fault anybody for that? Old must go. You must come. That's the way it's going to be. You can't stay on the same spot and be saying, I'm not going to allow. The way you are raised as young people and you say, no, your children are smarter. If you, I mean, in the past, we will store the numbers in our head. Today, you don't have to do so. It's something I thought it of. Old must finally go away and new must come. And that's how it will evolve as we go. Drones are there to carry things from one place to another. In the past, if you must send a mail, what will you do? You write a letter, take it to Naples and send it and it will get there in six months' time. And then they reply you in another six months' time. So one year, you are busy writing back and forth. For many of you who studied abroad many, many years ago, so you write a letter to the University of Oxford and then it doesn't come back until three months. By the time the letter comes back, admission has elapsed. Is that the same case now? You write a mail yesterday, by today you have a reply. You even take your phone and call the school and say, oh, hey, what's happening there? In the past, we'll go to Naples, Nightel in uh, Allen Avenue, Uraola House, and then we go and pay money, and then we want to make a call. And then we'll be 200 of us. They'll be calling us one by one with Tali to make international call. But right from your phone right now, you can make a call. You can do anything you want to do. In fact, you don't want to use the regular call. You can go on WhatsApp and call. Oh, you are even angry. You can get it on video. And I want to even see the man that is there. 
old must go and new must come. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. Old must go. And more, more, more. We have not even seen what will happen yet. I need you to imagine what happens in 20 years' time from today. All manner of things will happen. The world would have changed so much that you would not recognize the same world that you used to live in. That's how God has designed it. Ask our parents who were born in the 1930s, 1940s. They will tell you. I've been to the church in my hometown that was built in 1931. My granddad built the first church in our village in those days. So, and I went there and I saw the church and I said, so this was what they were calling church. This is church. You haven't seen church these days that you see chosen media carrying things and recording. Old must go. And they too, they are struggling. They built a new church and are trying to rearrange it so that it can look like a modern church. Otherwise, nobody will go there again. Nobody will go there again. It doesn't matter how powerful the man of God there is. They won't go there. Many of us, when we were young, I remember that in those days, Jehovah Witness people would carry their Bible. And then they come with their children to our houses. And then they knock the door. So as we are growing, I say, don't come here. Don't, don't, don't let them come here. How many of them have you seen lately? Because they refuse to change the tactics of how they evangelize to the people. They lost out in the entire thing. That's what has happened. Is, are they preaching the correct message? Yes. Whatever they had in that computation that they are teaching to us, is it correct? Is this the Bible? Yes. But once you retain your old ways and you say this is the way we have always done it and nothing is going to change it, you, are, you, have, lost, uh, you have lost ground. You have lost ground. You have lost your position. And that person will lose out completely in life. Old must go. And new must come. That's how God designed it. Somebody who is expecting something new to happen to him. Put your hands together for Jesus this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 58 verse 12, to corroborate that, Isaiah 58 verse 12, it says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the bridge, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Isaiah 58 verse 12. The seventh reason why we must celebrate new beginning. Because God is still in the business of building new institutions. God is doing new things. He's said to do new things with you and with me. Hebrews 11, verse 9 to 10. Hebrews 11, 9 to 10. He said, by faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundation whose builder and maker is God. God is still building new institutions. Today you look like an ordinary person. But God is about to build you into an institution. There are people who have become institutional. They are just one single human being. But once you mention their name, they have become institution. They are no longer Mr. So and so. Even though he's still alive and Mr. So. But things that connect to him have made him an institution. As a boy, for example, it's an institution, whether you take it or, or leave it. Dangote, who is probably the biggest man in the whole of Africa in terms of this, I'm sure everybody needs a bit of that. Everybody needs. If you don't need this, just don't worry. But they are still making more. It has become an institution. If he dies today, every structure that has been set there will continue to run. Many of us have not had major achievements, so we are just small people in our own right. But God wants to build you into an institution. When you have laid your hands on certain things and you start something new you have never done before, your name rings beyond your generation. It goes into the future. Ford Foundation is a foundation. Ford, that was the founder of the vehicle, of the car making industry in America, remains an institution. Warren Buffett remains an institution. Bill Gates, all of these people that you can mention their name today, even though they are alive, doing some other things, but they have become an institution. God is willing to make everyone that is here this morning institutions in our own right in the name of Jesus Christ. Let me close this morning. Why must we give thanks unto the Lord for a new beginning? For the hope of a better tomorrow. For the hope of a better tomorrow. Job 14, verse 7 to 9. Job 14, 7 to 9. He said, For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground. Yet through the scent of water, when it can feel a bit of water coming, it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. That is hope for everyone that is there. Can you say a lot of amen to that? It doesn't matter how well or how badly you have traveled. There is hope for tomorrow. God keeps us alive so that we can have hope. Anyone who does not have hope here is a dead man. 
There is nothing to live for when hope is lost. Everyone who has hope and knows that God who has helped so so person can help me too. You hold on to that, but tomorrow will be all right. That's why faith and hope are brothers. You cannot claim you have faith without having hope. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Things you can't even see, but you believe in your heart that God will bring it to pass. He will make it happen. Though your beginning may be small, your latter end shall greatly increase. That means it doesn't matter what you are going through right now. That is hope for me. That is hope for me. That's what you must say to yourself consistently. God who has made the grace great. They were not there like that many years ago. But God turned them and made them great. So he kept you alive so that you can have hope for tomorrow. You can have hope for tomorrow. You don't die in your sin. You don't die in your anger, in your bitterness, in your rottenness. There is hope for tomorrow. He wants to give you a new beginning. So the beginning of hope is to say, today I'm making up my mind to start a new life. Today, I want to start something new because God has said to me, I have hope. My future is bright. Let's begin it on a new note. Shall we close our eyes unto the Lord this morning? As, and we speak to God. There is hope for tomorrow. Everyone who is alive this morning has hope. That's why you came into the house of the Lord. And the best way to begin the step of faith is to surrender to, to Jesus. To surrender your life unto him. Is to begin and kneel with him. Is to tell him, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And that's the hope that we are building upon. Not in our strength, not in our might, not in our wisdom, not in our money, not in our power. Our hope is built on nothing less. And if you are here this morning, you want to surrender your life to that Jesus that we are building our hopes upon. We are not speaking in vain. We are speaking based on the hope that we have in Jesus that what is done before, he can do it again. If you are here this morning, you want to surrender your life unto Jesus, why don't you wave your hands wherever that you are seated this morning? Wherever you are seated this morning, I'd like to pray with you. You want to say to Jesus, you can do my hope. I am tired. I am famished. I am tired. I can't carry on, but I need you to inject a bit of hope into me. Why don't you wave your hands unto Jesus? Let's pray for you this morning. You can begin this new journey afresh with Jesus. He wants to, for your shame, give you double blessings. So if you are there this morning, just wave your hands unto him as I pray with you. Just wave your hands unto him. What a great privilege you have this morning to surrender your life unto Jesus if you have not done so. You have given your life before, but you walked away. When trouble came, winds blew, troubles of this world blew you out of the course. But you want to be restored back unto him this morning. Thank you, our brother, whose hands are raised. You can rise up on your feet as well. Just rise up wherever that you are. Just rise up. You will be attended to where you are standing. I don't need to bring you forward. This is a decision between you and God. Just speak to him. Tell him, my hope is built on you, not on anything else. I want you to reform my life. Wash me by the power that is in the blood of Jesus. Save me from everything that I need to be saved from. Save me from myself. Save me from sin. Save me from sorrow. Save me from anger. Save me from bitterness. I receive a new dose of hope this morning. For a better tomorrow, I receive a new strength, a new dose of hope, a new dose of help. You have spared me up until now so that I can have a new beginning. Thank you for this grace that you have made available. Blessed be God forevermore. In Jesus' name we have prayed.